basically. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. Namash. Hello everyone. Thank you all for joining. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the 32nd class of entering into the middle way. We counted. Um, so thank you very much, Geshema, for this priceless teaching. Uh, I want to uh, to remind everyone uh, that this uh, class, this course, and the um, all other activity of Dharma Friends of Israel. Uh, is possible thanks for your support and your donation throughout the time. Uh, I'm posting in the chat, uh, you have the option to support uh, the teacher and the activity of Dharma Friends of Israel also in the present and in the future. Um, and also if you want to send questions, you can send them to my uh, email and I'm passing them on to Geshema. Uh, so thank you all very much and uh, have a great uh, class. Okay, great. Thank you, Shir, for that. Uh, also, thank you, thank you, Shir, for sending those questions. I received them. I never thanked you for that. All right. Okay, so let's start, of course, with the meditation. I'm just setting my stopwatch here. Okay. So as usual, we start with some breathing meditation followed by generating the right motivation. Now visualize in this space in front of you the manifestation of great compassion and wisdom arising in the form of the Buddha. Who 
who's of one nature with your Lama. And surrounding the Buddha, all the great beings, the masters of India, of Tibet, and all the other Buddhist traditions. And again, all of them inseparable from your Lama. And also think that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. Constantly having experiences that they do not want and craving for lasting happiness, lasting satisfaction. And due to their basic misapprehension of reality, unable to find that peace and satisfaction. and remembering their basic Buddha nature. That's fast generate a feeling of closeness towards all these sentient beings. A feeling of warmth and acceptance towards them. And out of this affectionate love towards all sentient beings, we then generate the wish, may they be free from whatever keeps them from attaining that which they yearn for, this lasting peace and satisfaction. And may I be able to protect them from whatever causes their unwanted suffering, their pain and misery. And then that 
great compassion turns into the special attitude, the determination, I will do whatever I can to help sentient beings to find liberation from all their problems and the causes of those problems. And since I can realistically only do so if I first become a Buddha myself, may I therefore become a Buddha for the welfare of all these sentient beings. And it's also with this motivation that I today study Chandakirti's words in order to be able to contemplate and meditate on the path to enlightenment. And so holding on to this motivation, we'll recite the prayers together. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And now specifically directed at all sentient beings, the four measurables. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And then particularly directed at the Buddha in front of us and all the great masters from the different traditions. Reverently I prostrate with my body, speech and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. I 
and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence. And turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. Okay. All right. Well, I received a few more questions. So sometimes I address those questions in private if I find that more effective. Sometimes um, I'll talk about them here in class or during the session together here. Um, so I'd like to address some of those. And again, in the context, of course, for next week, what you should mainly focus on besides and right now it's not mentioned as much but of course it's still a huge part of everything we do it should still be the center of everything we do as uh, stressed by his holiness uh, the Dalai Lama frequently over and over you've just possibly taken uh, the bodhicitta we just done the bodhicitta ritual um, the thought well focusing on all sentient beings the way we've done before, the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering. And then, of course, based on that wish, the wish to become a Buddha in order to be able to fulfill that first wish that all sentient beings be free from suffering and that we can contribute to it in the most effective way. But, of course, that is the, uh, the method aspect. And we also need the wisdom aspect, understanding of reality and Last time, um, well, there was one question about ignorance. Someone asked about ignorance, um, what that actually means. We talk about ignorance. Um, I don't want to say I don't want to say that much about it, but just to understand that this word ignorance, which in Tibetan just really means not knowing, that that is a type of mind that is so harmful, which we can totally understand just in our day-to-day -day life in the sense that there are two types of ignorance one is just a mere not knowing and the other is misapprehending things in the way that we're totally we perceive the opposite of what's actually there so not knowing what's going on it's obvious that that is potentially dangerous not knowing well there's a red traffic light not knowing what's going to happen in the future not knowing what to take care of etc so just not knowing it's like a blind person um, trying to walk through i don't know a field of glass but even worse than that is this misapprehension of reality of course on the deepest level perceiving things to be inherently this that and the other but on a lesser less subtle level of perceiving that which is constantly changing to remain the same to believe happiness can be found outside of ourselves satisfaction the thing we yearn for so much like a lasting peace lasting satisfaction but looking in the wrong place and of course self-centeredness believing that we are at the center of the universe and believing that this self-centered attitude is actually benefiting us it's it's serving us well so there are so many wrong views that are the opposite of reality, and that leads to all our problems. But hopefully it'll become clearer how also not understanding reality, this basic misapprehension, leads to so much trouble. Why does it lead to trouble? Because, as mentioned before, we hold on to things as being so solid and so concrete. And out of that, we then generate aversion we generate attachment and so forth now i gave the example of um yuval Noah harari's book um he mentions peugeot um in this book what's it called um the history of humankind or something i forget now what it's called um anyway you know which book i'm talking about wait let me just, just quickly check 
for those who were not there last time. Yes, A Brief History of Humankind. Now, in that book, he gives an excellent description of phenomena that he is to use his words are not as concrete. Uh, according to him, they're just, uh, well, figments of our imagination in the sense that they're not as concrete as they may seem. And I totally agree with him, but I would argue the example he gives, you can apply this to everything. And uh, actually, one of the questions that I, I received was that the example of Peugeot wasn't that clear, whether I could use a whiteboard. But unfortunately, I have a white wall behind me, but I don't have a white wall, a whiteboard, so I couldn't. And it would take too much time. And I don't know much about it. I just, I just used what is in there. And any other example would work just as well. I just like the way he described the example of this uh, car manufacturer or car company or Peugeot, um, I think it's called SA. So the, the point here is really that in terms of, well, a company such as Peugeot, what is it called, like a non-liability or something, a, a limited liability company, something we may work for our entire life, um, something we are attached to, this, this company, we may only buy cars from that company, etc. So it seems something very concrete. But if you start analyzing what is so concrete about it, it's, it's almost like there's this bowl, there's this knedle, as I'd like to say, this knedle of Peugeot, you know, this, this, this solid thing in the space in front of us called Peugeot. But what is Peugeot really? It was founded by someone, but obviously the founder is not Peugeot. And then it consisted at some point of what, I don't know, 200,000 different workers all over the world. It consisted of, well, different manufacturing bases, um, the cars themselves. Um, of course, it was, it was registered somewhere as a, well, limited liability company and so forth. So it does exist, it definitely exists, but none of the things I just mentioned are Peugeot itself. Now, I've used another example of a monastery and um, you can use other things such as, I mean, I, I find a football club um, um, really helpful. So to think of a, a football club, so I did my warm homework, I looked up some uh, Israeli football clubs and the sound of this club I like the most. So that's the one I present to you. Hapoel Be'er Sheva. I just love the sound of it. It sounds very uh, Israeli. Maccabi Haifa was second choice, but I prefer the Hapoel Be'er Sheva. Anyway, if you think about this, and I looked up the football club, actually I did. So there are people, oh my God, for their football club, they're hardcore fans. And they possibly feel very close to everyone else being of that say or following the same football club and possibly dislike those that don't follow this club. So there are some strong emotions in, involved, possibly much stronger than when it comes to Peugeot or a monastery. Well, there's a lot of attachment towards monasteries, of course there too, um, but I guess there's, well, and there's also some rivalry, uh, but going back to this football club, um, I'm going to get to the right Wikipedia entrance <laughs> with regard to this football club. It seems something so concrete, this, this particular, well, Be'er Sheva football club. The point is here, what is this? What is really this concrete club? What is this football club? Well, there was a founder, it was founded 71 years ago, I, I learned, um, by some person who, who was actually part of Hapo e Ramad Gan. He found so a different football club and there's an owner or a lady owns the football club and it's actually had in terms of the, the grounds, it played at different venues. There was the, the, the venue of uh, the old stadium of Beersheba, the Vasamil stadium and now it's Turner stadium, stadium. All right. So in terms of who founded it, the person is long gone. Probably. Yeah, very likely long gone. Um, then the stadium, it's never in the same place. And I even looked up the players. Now, I'm not going to take it as far. I've actually practiced saying some of their names, but I'm not going to do that. That takes too long. So you've got a number of, well, at least 11 and then a lot more. It's a whole list of them online. Incredible what you find. So 
None of those is this football club, okay? If you really look, what is very concretely this football club? Well, it's made of things that are not the football club at all. And to quote um, Mr. Harari, to quote him, this is something, there's no, there's, there's nothing concrete here. There's nothing concrete here in that there's nothing physical actually there. Well, there's something physical, of course, people playing the football, there's the ball itself, there's the stadium that they played at. But as in like something concrete, that is the football, the, the football club itself, nothing concrete there. Well, he uses Peugeot, but it's the same for the football club, especially since new players come all the time. All right. Now, I would argue, well, that is true for anything that exists. Of course, if it doesn't exist, that's a whole different matter. His argument, and he will disagree with Mr. Harari, when he says, well, you give the example, you remember of the bread in church when the priest uh, does a certain ritual and says the bread now turns into the body of Christ. Well, if that's, if, if that's meant literally, then I would say that doesn't even exist conventionally because it's a piece of bread. It doesn't turn into Christ, just as a statue does not turn into the actual Buddha, all right? Just as when we breathe in and breathe out and do the practice of Donglen, we're not actually taking on the suffering of sentient beings. We may think along these lines and it may be helpful, but in the end, conventionally, none of this happens. Now, with regard to the football club and Peugeot, those are a basis of imputation that is valid. All right. But as I said, you can go further. I would say you can go further. Just as Mr. Harari says, nothing can be pointed at, pointed at because it's not a physical object. Well, I would say, can we then even point at something that is a physical object? object? Or let's take something such as a person. A person is not a physical object. Has parts to it that are physical. The body is physical, just as a football is physical, or the body of the players of the 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 Be Beersheba football club. But we're not saying that these physical objects are the football clubs. We're not saying that the cars that are manufactured by the Peugeot company are the Peugeot company. So there's something physical there, but in the same way as, as the cars manufactured um, are not Peugeot, likewise, the body is not the eye. Now I can talk about this and uh, there's a lot of discussion on that, we, well, but basically we need to meditate on that. You need to meditate on that. And again, for this week to Remind yourself, just as this football club, and spend some time thinking about this. And again, also, of course, with the person. When you say, for instance, you see another person, you perceive that person, and you see that person, well, what are you actually seeing? Is there something physical there? Yeah, you see something physical, but that's not the person. You see the face of the person. We talk along these lines that someone, for instance, pokes my arm and I said they've touched me but have they really touched me is that the eye is my arm the eye and of course we'll find no my arm is not the eye and when I say you see me well are you actually seeing me or are you seeing something that is not me my face the front of my body that is not me really when you analyze what are you actually seeing who's talking right now are you hearing me talk? You hear a voice that you associate with me. And so you say you hear me talk. But what is that I you actually hear talking? Now that cannot be found. That is just like this football club. What is that I? It's just labeled on the basis of many parts that are not it. That are not the I based on a body that is not a person, based on a mind that is not a person, based on all those, we then label person. And we say, I see this person. I touch this person. I hear the voice of that person, right? In the same way, I went to see this football club. I like this football club. I wear the colors of this football club or I drive a car of this Peugeot company, etc. Now in everyday life, we can talk about it. But if we start analyzing, we start 
what is this exactly? What is this concrete? What is this Peugeot? All we find is things are not Peugeot. We don't find anything that can be concretely called Peugeot. Whether you talk about the, the causes, the results, what they give rise to, the money they make, it, the people working, none of those are Peugeot. And it's pretty clear, it's just labeled on the basis of all these non Peugeots. The same is true for the football club, the same is true for the eye. And still, on a very deep emotional level, we hold on to something very concrete that is the eye, very concrete that is the football club. And even, and here, when Mr. Harari says, well, there's no physical objects, take a physical object, take the table. When you, if there was a concrete table, like there was something concrete called the table, well, then how do you account for the fact when you touch some part of the table and you say, I've touched the table, then if that really, if you really touched a table in that moment, there was an inherent table, then that part of the table would be the table. Because why would you say if you touch the, the surface of the table, you say, I've touched the table. But if I ask you, is that the table? You would say, no, that's not the table. That's not it. That's just the surface of the table. And the surface of the table is not the table. So why then do we say, I touched the table? If the table existed inherently, that would be totally incorrect because you've just touched something that is not the table. It's the surface of the table, right? So in that way, what is that table? And I remember Geshe Tukdam Pesang, he gave some incredible example. I've mentioned them on different occasions. For instance, he gave this example with the table. It seems something so concrete. Yes, as Mr. Harari would probably say, that's a concrete table. That's something very concrete. It's not just a figment of our imagination. Well, I would claim, yes, it is. Well, it is because, and here I'm, I'm using Geshe Tukdam Pesang's example, he says, say, for instance, you hold on to the leg of the table. You hold on to this leg of the table, okay? You have this huge table, and you need to transport it to the next room. And there's four people doing it together. Let's say five. Um, and five people, and I'm holding one leg of this table. And now you're trying to get through the door, and you don't fit. You can't fit through the door. Now, I'm holding this table the whole time, all right? So I'm saying I'm holding the table. I'm holding a table leg, so I'm actually holding the table just as I touch the, the surface of the table and I can say I touch the table. And you see my face and you say you see me. So in the same way, I keep holding this table leg. And we realize the table is too big, so we have to disassemble it. And I keep holding onto this one leg. And once it's disassembled, we each take it, take our piece out of the, through the door to the next room. Am I holding a table when it's disassembled? I'm no longer holding a table, right? But I'm holding the same thing. While there was a table, I was holding this, this leg. And so therefore I was holding a table. And when it was disassembled, I didn't let go. And then I walk through this door, still holding the same thing. And while I'm holding it, someone assembles the table again. And now I'm holding a table again. What just happened? I'm holding a table. I'm not holding a table. I'm holding a table. Well, I, I'm holding the same thing. That is only possible because the table is merely labeled on the basis of certain parts that are assembled in a certain way. Right? This is why when I hold this table while it's disassembled, or when it's in this disassembled state, that's why I'm no longer holding a table, although I'm still holding the same thing. It can no longer be called that. So if the table existed concretely, very solidly, the way it appears, then no matter whether I disassemble it or not, whether it's assembled, it would always be a table. It couldn't change. Therefore, there's nothing concrete that can be called a table. It's just labeled. The same is true for the eye. So important. And of course, Chandakirti will go more into the eye, more towards the end of the text. He will especially deal with the eye, although um, 
usually it's said to be a little well easy it's hard to say but very important to start with it but nagajuna didn't start with the eye in his text and you saw a certain need starting with phenomena other than the eye and indirectly address the eye the, the self as well um, and so for that reason well this is what we're dealing with here with phenomena other than the eye in particular with regard to uh, cause and effect like i've said on a few occasions. So now I want to address another question someone asked, but here I'll have a harder time to be sure that I answer it correctly. Now I want to um, quickly go to the question itself because I think there's a misunderstanding. Um, here it says that we've already learned from Chandakirti that things are not produced in any of the four impossible ways from self, from other, from neither, from both then why do we still say that the previous moment of the snake's continuum is the cause of the next moment? To produce or to cause, or to cause sounds very much the same to me. Of course, because it is the same. This passage is totally right. Yes, it means the same, to produce or to cause. We're not saying that cause and effect, when we say other here, refuting, when I say something is produced from other, we're saying something inherently totally different, something inherently other. Being caused from a conventionally other phenomenon, yes, of course. Therefore, we say a seed, a sprout, a, a sprout is produced from a conventionally different, a conventionally other is produced or caused by a conventionally other cause, but not a totally different cause. This is a very interesting idea because we have a sense cause and effect are totally different. And that's why very often in Buddhism, there's a certain question that comes up quite a lot. And I've had answers to that, but I'm not that happy to it. So happy with it. The question very often is, in particular, when it comes to a continuum, a continuum of a person. This is also part of a question that was asked here. But never mind for now. Now, with regard to where we say a person is a continuum with earlier moments giving rise to later moments. Okay. Now, here in this case, we speak of a substantial cause. An earlier moment of me gives rise to a later moment of me and so forth. And sometimes the basis of imputation, I mean, the basis of imputation changes all the time. My body always changes. My mind always changes. And when I die... I'm left only with the subtle mind and body. I'm no longer left with this coarse body. Right now I'm touching my, you know, this coarse body. I'm left with a very subtle mind and a subtle energy. Those two are inseparable, the subtle energy and the body. They're inseparable. Now, based on that, I still label I, I still label person in the case of someone else. Um, so there's a very subtle body, a very subtle mind, and labeled on that, I still say person. And then that subtle body, that subtle mind is then reconnected, is connected to another fertilized egg, for instance, and another person grows. And the basis of mutation has, it's very different to now, but it's still, it's still a continuum. And oftentimes what is said that, well, Actually, when it comes to karma and cause and effect as part, of course, of the law of karma, isn't that actually really weird that we have to experience the result of something in this lifetime someone else created? As in, like, that was a totally different mind and body. Of course, actually, yesterday's I was also a totally different mind and body. But, of course... I do have a sense of connection to that person yesterday mentally, but from a previous life, well, isn't it actually really unfair? Someone with a totally different body, a totally different mind has created an action and I now I have to experience the result of that. And in the same way, the, the causes I accumulate now, a totally different person has to experience. Why do I care? Why do I care in this lifetime that I produce a certain, I don't know, I kill someone, etc. What do I care? I'm not going to experience the result of that. That's not going to be me. 
And I remember there were different answers to that. One answer, like we should have compassion for that person. Yes, that's that's definitely beautiful. We should do that. But on the other hand, that implies that the cause and the result, that resultant person in the future are inherently different. They're inherently different. It's like a totally different disconnected person. That would be the other extreme that they're inherently different. They're not inherently different. They're only conventionally different. Inherently different would be like totally disconnected. Therefore, I could say in the same way, well, I could take poison today because the person who's sick tomorrow, it's not this person here right now. And how that feels wrong, we know. We know there's a connection between definitely the mind that's going to suffer from being sick tomorrow, although that's not the same mind. And still, we're careful about not ingesting poison, even if we only get sick next week. Okay, Why? Because we perceive, and we have this before, we don't perceive instinctively that they're inherently different. Okay, We had this as part of the verses. You remember one of the later verses said that actually instinctively we don't feel, this is a more philosophical, this is a philosophical uh, assertion that has got nothing to do with our innate sense. I believe I exist inherently. I have an innate sense that I exist inherently and other things exist inherently. But there is no innate sense, and that's what Chandakirti says, there is no innate, innate sense that a father is inherently different from the son because there's a sense of a connection between the two of them. Therefore, actually, the sense that they're inherently different is not innate, but it comes through intellectual reasoning based on the fact that we believe other things exist inherently. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that with regard to cause and effect, they do, a cause creates the effect, it causes, it produces the effect, but cause and effect are not inherently different. And that is what Chandrakirti is trying to prove here. And in response to this question, yes, produce and cause have the same meaning, but we're not saying inherently. All right, so I hope I've answered that. But to go back to the text now, very important, um, these five, these three consequences, what I'd like to start with is to just repeat quickly, how do we get to this argument? In the sense that, in particular with the different philosophical schools, I want to bring this closer to you because very soon, starting with verse, I forget now, 38 or 39 or maybe later, well, we'll start talking about the Chittamatra school anyway. That will be addressed in the context of cause and effect. Now, to say this much, when the Buddha started teaching, basically he taught about the eye. The eye was always a very important part of Buddha's teachings. And initially, when he taught, especially the philosophical schools of the Vaibhashika and the Satantrika, which from the point of view of emptiness are considered to be lower uh, philosophical systems, um, just from the point of view of emptiness. So with, with, in relation to those, the Buddha didn't talk about emptiness. He just talked about the self, the I doesn't exist the way it appears as a permanent, partless, independent entity. He didn't talk about inherent existence in that context. So based on this view, it just addresses a certain coarse type of misperception of the eye. But in terms of the things, the other objects, such as body, mind, the objects around us, the way they appear to us as objectively, inherently over there, existing in and of themselves, well, they exist that way, according to those two schools. Then the next school would be the Chittamatra school, where in particular with regard to atomically established things. So things that are made of atoms, physical objects, matter for that matter. So matter, material objects. Well, when we analyze, when we analyze. So previously, if we just follow the Vaibhashika or the Satantrika view, well, there's this external world. There, the way we look at the world usually, there are atoms, there are other bits, but they exist very concretely over there. There's a cupboard, there's this, there's that. And the sense that, yeah, maybe the eye doesn't exist as concretely, but everything else does. 
But with the Chitta Matra school, they already start questioning that. They start going, well, if everything is made of atoms, then we start taking apart these building blocks and what previously seems so concrete is no longer there. So this very concrete world, it starts disappearing. So actually there's nothing there. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama usually equates that to quantum physics. When he says the, the philosophers of the Chitta Master schools that say there's actually nothing there, there are no atoms. They just appear like atoms, but there's nothing out there. Is similar to quantum physicists, uh, physician, quantum physicians. So I don't know what they say. There's nothing there, or I don't know. But the point is that, according to the Chittamatra school, they take apart, although they they couldn't see atoms. Well, still can't see atoms, but they they didn't know. They didn't have the sophisticated understanding of atoms. But there was a basic understanding of these these building blocks of of the material world. And based on that, they understood you can take it further apart and further apart, but there's nothing concrete that you ever get to, which led them to say, there is no external world. It's just all in the mind because there's nothing concrete there. That's the Chitta Madra school. Already moving towards emptiness, not just of the eye, but emptiness of phenomena other than the eye. All right, without really going all the way as far as the next school will go into it. But just to give you a sense, the Chitta Matra school already says, well, there is no objective, there's no objective external world. Okay, then came the Madhyamika, and those are divided into the Svatantrika and the Prasangika, where the Svatantrika says, basically, well, there is an external world, but it doesn't exist independently of mind. So they don't refute an external world, but they say there is no truly existent world. External, yes, but not truly existent in that. It needs another mind, needs to appear to the mind. Otherwise, it's impossible for it to exist. While the Prasangika says, well, it's more than that. Appearance to the mind, yes, but more than that were the Svatantrika. So the Svatantrika would say that phenomena exist inherently. There is some essence that every phenomenon has, but despite that essence, that's the Svatantrika, not the Prasangika. So despite that essence, they, they, only, they can only exist, these phenomena can only exist if they appear to the mind, but they have to exist inherently. Therefore, the Svatantrika Although they accept external existence and they do say phenomena do not exist truly independently of the mind, still they cannot let go of that last bit of, well, phenomena exist inherently. There must be something there that differentiates or that uh, distinguishes me from another person, my body from another uh, body, the, 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 the atoms that make up, that make a, a that, that constitute a pear and the atoms that constitute an apple. There must be some intrinsic difference, which makes sense to us to a certain degree, of course, when we think about it. And the Prasangika is the school that totally denies that. Now, if we go back to the text, to these arguments we heard about last time, when Chandakirti argues, well, if according as, and he's mainly addressing the, the Chitta Matra and also the Svatantrika school, who do assert there is emptiness, there's something called emptiness. The Chitta Matra school says the lack of external phenomena, that's emptiness. The Svatantrika school says, Madhyamika Svatantrika, they say the lack of phenomena existing truly. That is the emptiness of phenomena. In other words, the lack of phenomena, although they exist inherently, but the lack of phenomena, the non-existence of phenomena as existing independently of the mind, of appearing to the mind. Okay. Now, to say it again, in other words, the emptiness in the Chitta Mantra school means no external phenomena. No external phenomena, that is emptiness according to the Chitta Matra school. The Svatantrika school says 
no phenomena, the non-existence of phenomena as existing independently of the mind, as existing independently from appearing to the mind, to a mind, a correct mind, to, to a non-mistaken mind, in other words, or a, a, yeah, appearing to a correct mind in that sense. Um, so, in other words, they say nothing exists truly, because if it existed truly, it could exist without having to appear to a mind, and that is impossible. However, they still hold on to inherent existence. All right. And now the Chitta, the, the Prasangika school says, well, you do accept this kind of emptiness, and you also accept that phenomena do that, that this emptiness, that the emptiness, when you understand that emptiness, that you have a mind that's called a meditative equipoise that directly realizes that emptiness. That's what you were saying, Chitta Matrans and mainly Svatantrika. You are actually asserting that. But if phenomena, if, if you accept that kind of mind, and at the same time you say that phenomena exist inherently, that would mean that phenomena cannot exist at all. Okay, can we have the root text, Ashir? That's verse 34. Thank you. If the intrinsic characteristics of things were to arise dependently, so on one hand, phenomena exist intrinsically, and at the same time, they arise dependently. That is exactly the view of the Chitta Matrans, the, the, um, well, all the other Buddhist schools, other than the Prasangika. So the first line describes the assertion of all the other Buddhist philosophers, except for the Prasangika, that phenomena exist intrinsically. They have intrinsic characteristics, but they still depend on things, which is a contradiction in itself. If, if you still assert that, and at the same time you assert that there is this mind a meditative equipoise, in other words, a mind that arises through meditation, that understands the ultimate nature of phenomena. In particular with the Svatantrika, saying all phenomena lack true existence. They do not exist independently of appearing to a mind. If you say that, if that if, if that's lack of true existence, lack of ultimate existence. If you're saying that there is a mind that perceives exactly that, that emptiness of all phenomena, well, according to you, that mind would deny the existence of everything and not just of the lack of ultimate existence. It would, it would refute the existence of all phenomena. Nothing would exist. And that's the consequence. That's the absurdity here. This is the absurdity that it leads to. If phenomena exist inherently, then it would mean that, that they don't exist at all because there is a mind that perceives the ultimate nature of all phenomena. And if you argue, well, before that mind was there, before that mind arose, before I cultivated that mind, everything existed. There were cars and tables, etc. And let's say I now meditate, according to the Svatantrika school, and meditate on emptiness. And now I realize the ultimate nature of all phenomena. If I still held on to, and this is all hypothetically, of course, this is not possible. You can't see the ultimate nature of all phenomena, but still hold on to inherent existence. But let's say it was possible the absurdity hypothetically it was possible well Chandakirti argues if if I have that mind that perceives the ultimate nature of all phenomena then to that mind all phenomena disappear nothing appears nothing appears and that would mean if they appeared before and they existed before and now they no longer exist well they would have been destroyed by that mind Okay, things would come to be destroyed by denying their a certain mode of existence. Well, according to the Svatantrika, their ultimate existence. So the emptiness that you claim, you Svatantrika claim, can be realized would be the cause of the destruction of things. Because by understanding, you're saying you're realizing the ultimate nature of phenomena. 
but the actual ultimate nature of phenomena, if phenomena exist inherently, then their ultimate nature would be just that thing. For instance, a vase's a vase or cars, a car's existence, the car itself, if it existed in, inherently, that would be its ultimate nature. It, like if you, what does ultimate nature mean? It actually means that which you find, that which you, which you find when you analyze it, the thing that you really find to be there. And if you really find the, the, the car, when you look for the car, if there's an inherent car, well, when you look among its part, you should find this inherent car. But when the emptiness, when you realize emptiness and the car is not realized, then there is no car. Then there is no car. It would be destroyed by this mind. Well, there's actually two ways of looking at it uh, in, in terms of the argument. Are you saying... This meditative aqua poise realizes the lack of inherent existence, or are you saying it realizes the lack of ultimate existence as asserted by the Svatantrika? There's this difference between the two schools. As I said, the Svatantrika merely says, well, phenomena, the ultimate nature of phenomena, that they do not exist independently of appearing to the mind. The Prasangika says that's not all. That's not enough. You're not refuting enough saying that. You're not refuting enough. If you say phenomena do not exist truly or ultimately just because they do not exist without appearing to a correct mind, we, the Prasangika, would say that's not enough. The Prasangika says not just that. On top of that, there's nothing from the side of the object. There's nothing to be found from the object itself. When you look for, when you, when you leave aside the label, if you can leave aside the label car, you won't find anything, nothing from the side of this object that can be called car. You won't find anything there. It's merely labeled. The Svatantrika would say, no. No, it's called a car because there really is something there. There's something there that is different to a bicycle. Okay. All right. Now, therefore, here the, the, the argument can be presented in terms of phenomena are destroyed by the meditative equipoise that can be presented in two ways. Are you saying strictly only from the Svatantrika school point of view? Of course, they wouldn't say that you negate inherent existence with this meditative aqua poise. They don't say you realize the lack of inherent existence with a meditative aqua poise. They say, well, you, what is, what is this mind, the meditative aqua poise? What does it actually realize? What does it understand? The lack of ultimate existence, which in other words means the lack of a phenomenon existing independently of appearing to a correct mind. That's all this, this mind, uh, this meditative act of poise deny, uh, refutes or negates. That's all it negates. So that's the emptiness that this mind realizes. But the Prasangika then argues, this is one way of looking at this first consequence, the Prasangika then says, well, if, if that is the mind that realizes how things really exist, because that's what emptiness means, that's the actual mode, the final mode of existence. Well, if the, if the car, as an example, if the car exists inherently, well, that's the actual mode of existence of the car. That's the ultimate mode of existence of the car. That's what this mind should therefore realize. And if it doesn't realize it, well, then the car cannot exist. Because if the mind that realizes the ultimate mode of existence, that is the car itself, doesn't realize the car, well, how can the car exist? Therefore, if you say the car existed before and now, realizing the ultimate nature of the car, the car does not appear to that mind, well, then this meditative agripoise must have destroyed the car. Okay, that's one absurdity. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it, and that seems more to be what is in the scriptures, it could also be 
present it in the way saying, well, from the point of view of the Prasangika school, when you look for the car, you, you find, all you find is the non-inherent existence of the car. That is really what this meditative equipoise does. You're searching for something there and all you find is not the car. Therefore, if you find not the car, if all you find is not a car and you're still insisting that the car exists inherently, then this meditative equipoise must have destroyed the car. So this is really more how it's presented in the scriptures, although one could argue, but you were saying this to a Svatantrika person. Well, the Svatantrika person doesn't accept that, doesn't accept that the meditative equipoise actually realizes the lack of inherent existence. So to make this connection, I guess it's helpful to also look at the second argument, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the second absurdity to bring that into play to say well if phenomena existed inherently we should be able to find them okay that's exactly like i said just now so that's that's what is what the meditative equipoise is the meditative equipoise is a mind that goes deeper that goes into the actual mode of existence it deals with what makes a car a car where is that car is it this part? Is it that part? First, it engages, engages in ultimate analysis. And it comes to the conclusion, analyzing, analyzing what makes the car the car? What makes Peugeot Peugeot? What makes the table the table? The past and the past. And, and it can't find anything. And that is the non-inherent existence of phenomena. It finds the non-inherent existence of phenomena. And if you assert that that phenomena exist inherently, you've basically just refuted the existence of phenomena because the phenomena and their inherent existence are not to be separated. Well, when you refute their inherent existence, you're refuting them. Because according to you, there's no difference between an inherently existent car and a car. And if I refute a non the non-inherent existence of the car, according to you, I'm refuting the car, I'm negating the car. And again, if you say previously the car existed and now it's been negated by negating its inherent existence, well, you're saying the meditative equipoise has destroyed the car. All right. So those are the two ways that they're kind of like two ways to look at it in the sense of Either you believe the car is the actual nature of the car itself, the inherent existence of the car is the actual nature of the car. And when you realize the actual nature and the car disappears, well, you have a problem. Or you accept, all right, the meditative aqua poise, it actually negates inherent existence. The Svatantrika wouldn't say that, but if you take it, especially to the second um argument that follows from this first one well if you accept yes the meditative equipoise negates inherent existence especially since the satrans fatantrika they also they 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 res respond to the first consequence the first consequence saying well according to you the meditative equipoise would destroy all phenomena it negates their existence and if previously existed and now they don't, it means they've just destroyed the existence. They've just proven they can't exist, in other words. They've just proven that these things don't exist. Um, so therefore, that would mean it, it, the phenomena have to lack inherent existence. And the Svatantrika say, yes, well, we say, of course, they only exist conventionally. We say, yes, conventionally phenomena exist, um, do not exist inherently. And on the ultimate level, on the second, tr the, the second truth, as in like, well, conventional truth versus ultimate truth. So the, the Svatantrika actually say, in, in actuality, we only ex accept that phenomena exist inherently on the conventional level, not on the ultimate level. And in response to that, well, then Chandrakirti describes the second, the second consequence saying, well, but you were analyzing it on the ultimate level. We're here only dealing with the ultimate level because the conventional level, that is the level where we're not analyzing anything. How can you say a car exists inherently? 
do you are you saying because it appears to to exist inherently is it just because of its appearance the moment you analyze you're engaging right away into ultimate analysis so you're moving towards the area of ultimate of ultimate nature which is why this distinction doesn't make sense phenomena exist inherently on a conventional level but not on an ultimate level all right so if we can see the second verse therefore so in response really to that the Svatantrika is saying well on a conventional level we do not deny inherent existence um only on an ultimate level we do this on an ultimate level well in response to that Chandrakirti says well if phenomena are analyzed and we're just talking of the ultimate level on a conventional level to say they exist inherently we're analyzing we're moving away from the conventional level anyway so when such phenomena are analyzed nothing is found as their nature apart from suchness suchness is just another word for emptiness so nothing is found as their nature apart from suchness now when you say that conventionally they exist on what level are you talking about that if you're not analyzing them then you can't you, 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 if you're not analyzing them, and that's the conventional level, there's no reason for you to say they exist inherently, other than they appear that way, but just appearance, a lot of things appear incorrectly. So you have to move automatically towards the ultimate level. And therefore, if they cannot be found, if they cannot be found, and there's no contradiction in terms of... So this is also the argument here, very important. Um if the Svatantrika says that on a conventional level, phenomena exist inherently, well, which kind of valid cognition establishes the inherent existence of phenomena? A conventional valid cognition or an ultimate valid cognition? Okay, If something exists, it has to exist conventionally. And we've had the three uh, characteristics, the three features for something existing conventionally so it has to be known has to be known okay that's one but most importantly it cannot be refuted by a conventional valid cognizer and it cannot be refuted by an ultimate valid cognizer now Chandrakirti would say if you say that conventionally phenomena do exist on a conventional level they exist inherently well, how do you prove that? A conventional mind doesn't analyze phenomena to such a degree that you come to understand they don't exist inherently. And your, your ultimate mind doesn't even deal with inherent existence. It only deals with ultimate existence. In other words, it only goes so far as saying phenomena don't exist independently of appearing to our mind. It doesn't go as much as, as, as far as saying they don't exist from their own side inherently and so forth. They don't, it doesn't deny that. So in which, how can you actually establish that to be the case? And anyway, most importantly, according to you, when phenomena are analyzed, nothing is found as their nature apart from suchness. So the conventional truth of the everyday world should not be subjected to thorough analysis. So on a conventional level, we can say things exist, but on an ultimate level, everything starts disappearing. Everything starts disappearing. That's why we keep those two truths separately. We have to keep them separately because if we don't, and people oftentimes try to mix them together a little bit. And that's where the problem arises. It's always a problem because we say, well, if, if we start to analyze too much, things start disappearing. Where exactly is the car? Where does it start and where does it end? Okay, if you just look at where's the exact moment the car came into existence. Exact, very difficult. The moment you start looking at something exact, the exact moment came into existence. We can't really posit that. The exact, because each moment can be subdivided in further moments. What, where exactly, which atom is part of the car? If you look at a subatomic level, that's part of the car. That's part of the, that's part of the dust. Can't do that. I mean, the moment you try to be true, just laid back, just appearances, all right. It appears to be a car. It appears to be this. And of course, based on labeling, right based on a certain labeling the labeling we apply the thoughts it's this it's that and so forth well if we don't apply that and there's still some order to it it's not like making things up it's not like 
the, 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 the piece of bread in the in church becomes Jesus' body or um, the statue in front of me. That's the actual Buddha. It's a statue. It helps to think who is the Buddha to be inspired. But I know it's not it's not the Buddha. It's, it's a statue. So Buddha and statue, I mean, basically it's not a living being. In that case, therefore, there's still consistency, even within the conventional. All right. Therefore, we should separate those two. But the moment we go into analyzing how phenomena exist, well, according to you, and that's the second consequence, not only does the meditative equipoise would destroy all things, understanding that they don't exist inherently, but according to you, you should find something. What is it? What is that what you find? So phenomena could bear, could bear analysis. Could be would be res resistant to analysis. You would be able to find something when you engage engage in ultimate analysis, and you just can't. And the third consequence is that actually, you swatantrikas, when you say, and this is here where it becomes clearest with the third consequence, it's 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 um, directed at the swatantrikas. Although in the first and the second, you could still apply to the chitta matra, but here's pretty clear. It can only be the the swatantrika. When it says in verse 36, in the context of suchness, certain reasoning disallows arising from self or from something other, inherently other, and that same reasoning disallows them on the conventional level too. So by what means then is your rising established? So in other words, in other words, here, yeah, what this is saying that if you refute if you refute by means of analysis and, and negation that things exist conventionally by their intrinsic nature, so if you if you if you refute inherent inherent existence, in other words, you also refute ultimate existence. But if you do not, if you do not refute um, inherent existence, you also do not refute ultimate existence. In other words, in other words, this is really saying. The Svatantrika says we deny ultimate existence. We do not deny inherent existence. The Prasangika says actually they're the same thing. They say what you Svatantrika deny is too little. And that's not ultimate existence. You're not really refuting ultimate existence. You're just saying that phenomena do not exist independently of appearing to a mind while still accepting that they exist inherently. Therefore, you're not actually denying ultimate existence because ultimate existence is the same as inherent existence. True existence, ultimate existence, inherent existence, they all mean the same thing. They're just different words for the same thing. And if you deny one, if you negate one, you negate the other. So therefore, in the context of suchness, of emptiness, as also is accepted, of course, by the Svatantrika, well, if you do not allow the possibility of something arising from self or from ultimately something other, well, you're refuting inherent existence. You're refuting inherent existence, ultimate existence, inherent existence. So that same reasonings disallows them on the conventional level too. If you refute ultimate, ex ultimate existence or ultimately arising from other, it's just another way of saying so. So disallows, that is refute arising from self or other. It's just another way of saying you refute inherent existence. Then you also refute inherent existence on the conventional level. So whether on a conventional or an ultimate level, phenomena do not exist inherently. And therefore, if you deny, if you refute inherent existence you refute ultimate existence and when you refute ultimate existence you refute inherent existence so the prasagika says according to you you're not refuting ultimate existence what you claim to refute is not ultimate existence at all because that would mean you also refute inherent existence all right that's the third consequence the the moment i mean it's when i explain this um the moment I explain it, I become aware you really need a lot of knowledge of just emptiness, meditative vector points, and so forth. So it may not be fully comprehended unless you studied Madhyamika to a certain degree. 
Now, that's one of those examples. It may not be clear all the way through, but once you've studied what is to come, if you go back to this, it'll all fall into place. And sometimes we find that a little unsatisfying in the sense we want to understand it right now. But a lot of those studies are, the nature of those studies are that you need to go back to a lot of what you study. All right, but I want to leave it at that now. We'll meditate on this actually today. But let me say a little bit more the, the next verse. Um, verse, oh yeah, verses uh, 37. Now here, 37, and actually the first two lines of six of 38, someone is saying, well, if you're saying that on the level of both truth, ultimate truth, ultimate truth on the level of ultimate truth on the level of conventional truth if you say phenomena do not exist inherently well then nothing is possible they don't exist how can they exist if they neither exist inherently on the ultimate level nor on a conventional level and in response to that chandakirti says well empty things dependent on convergences such as reflections and so forth and so on are not unknown so in other words just because things such as cars and so forth, well, they may not exist the way they appear. And still, they may not exist inherently the way they appear, but they can still exist. They come together as being, coming together as like a convergence of many, so that they're dependent on many other parts, on many parts other than themselves. So they're basically a collection of parts that have come together and they exist and they perform their function even if they even if they do not exist the way they appear for instance a reflection of a face in the mirror it appears to be an actual face but it's not and still we can say although it appears in the way in which it doesn't exist it still exists the reflection exists the reflection is there even if it appears to us in the way in which it doesn't exist as an actual face if we're talking about reflection of a face here by implication reflection is always referring to reflection of a face in a mirror so therefore although it doesn't exist inherently doesn't exist the way it appears it still comes together as a result of many objects of many phenomena and it's known to the world we know things like that such as reflections etc and just as from an empty thing like a reflection, a perception can arise that bears its form. So even though it doesn't exist inherently with a car or, or reflection, it doesn't exist inherently, although it appears to exist in that way, well, still we can perceive those things. There's no contradiction. Likewise, it goes on to say in 38, the first two lines, likewise, although all things are empty, they do rise from emptiness in a robust way. <laughs> in other words, Although, robust way, they, <laughs> that's such a weird way of saying it. It's like, like they very well, basically. It says like they, they rise very well in Tibetan. It kind of says, although, and just as from an empty thing like a reflection. No, likewise, although all things are empty, they do arise very well from emptiness, which basically means they don't arise from emptiness literally, but it means that because they, they're empty of inherent existence, they can arise very well. Because if they existed inherently, they couldn't arise. If they existed inherently, that would mean a cause could not arise, could not give rise to an effect because the cause wouldn't change. For an effect to arise, the cause must change. Only if the cause changes, then the effect can arise. So that wouldn't be possible. If it exists inherently, how can it change? An effect could also not arise because it would arise in dependence on its cause. But if it exists inherently, it doesn't depend on anything. Therefore, things can only arise really well if they don't exist inherently. Therefore, the argument before that nothing would be possible if either on a convention, if neither on the conventional nor on an ultimate level, phenomena exist inherently, in response to that, Chandakirti says, no, it's the opposite. Things are only possible because they do not exist inherently. In fact, everything becomes possible because phenomena are merely labeled. Therefore, you can have cause, effect, etc. And therefore, it goes on, and it goes on to say in 38, since no intrinsic nature exists in either of the true truth, phenomena are neither eternal nor annihilated. 
So they exist conventionally, therefore they do exist, but they do not exist inherently. So they don't exist eternally, inherently, in and of themselves, non-changing. All right. Now, I hope these last two verses were clear enough. It's really just a summary of what was said before. But using um, this argumentation, and we, well, the consequences, and I'll go through it again now with the meditation. And next time, we'll start with um, dealing with the, the argument. Like, so far, the argumentation was more like the argument was more on the level of how do phenomena exist on a conventional and an ultimate level? And now, so abandoning, therefore, uh, the two extremes, the eternal the view of eternalism or reification and the view of nihilism. So that was mainly established, um, especially now with this last verse, uh, again, summarizing this. And the next verses dealing with the Chitta Mantra school basically talks about how cause and effect become tenable, how cause and effect are actually possible. And for that, we need to deal with the Chitta Matra school, how the mind can continue on, can give rise to another mind, even though there's no Alavijnaya and so forth. Okay, so I will talk more about this next time. The person who also sent me some question, I wasn't able to answer um, this person's question yet. There was a question about cause that, saying something arises from a cause is quite simplistic. I'll address this as part of last time. So please um, allow me to uh, talk about it next week. Okay, great. That's good enough for today. Um, I've, I've really tried to speak a little slower, but I've forgotten that time. So I, I, I was aware later on. So I apologize if it was too fast. I hope I was able to present this uh, in, a, in a way that it's a little clearer. And if you have questions, you're welcome. Questions, you're welcome to ask, uh, send a message to share. All right, so now we'll go through the three consequences by way of meditating on them. All right, so let's start with a little bit of breathing meditation and then I'll guide you through the analytical meditation. If phenomena really existed the way they appear to us, as having some inherent intrinsic essence, And that would mean that the meditative equipoise the non-dual mind realizing the ultimate nature of all phenomena would negate the existence of all phenomena.
if phenomena could be found of an ultimate analysis. And upon realizing their ultimate mode of existence, we should realize those phenomena. However, that's not the case. The mind that realizes the ultimate nature of the car, for instance, does not realize the car. It only realizes the non-findability of the car. And if the car nonetheless existed inherently, the meditative equipoise would have negated the existence of the car. And if the car had existed previous to the meditative equipoise, No, now no longer exists as his existence was negated by the meditative equipoise. That non dual mind would have destroyed the car. In fact, it would have destroyed all conventional phenomena. Since this non-dual mind realizes the non-findability of all phenomena. But saying that phenomena conventionally 
possess inherent existence, but not ultimately. would similarly not make sense. Since inherent existence can only be determined if we engage in ultimate analysis. If inherent existence really existed, we should find it upon engaging in ultimate analysis. Yet the conventional level is by definition the level when we do not engage in ultimate analysis. Therefore, if phenomena existed inherently, not only would they be destroyed by the meditative equipoise, but they would also bear analysis. The more we analyze, the Peugeot company, or a football club, the more concrete they should appear to us. since inherent existence bears analysis. And if we do not negate inherent existence, as the third absurdity, we could also not refute or negate ultimate existence or true existence. For those who have the same meaning. And if we negate one, we negate the other.
effort to conclude. In order to understand the ultimate mode of all phenomena, we need to go all the way. Denying a little bit and still holding on to some concrete existence will never be enough. certainly not be enough to overcome our attachment to the eye, to other phenomena. And now spend a moment just focusing on whatever conclusion you've come to before we dedicate. So now to dedicate whatever positive potential we've accumulated. May this, of course, become a cause for our own enlightenment. But also, right now, in this very life, enable us to remove our own sufferings, our own worries, Help us to open our heart to others. Be more kind and more loving. And may also have a positive impact, positive influence on our environment. May I help those who are sick like Tali Lubin and everyone else. contribute to more happiness to others in the way <clears throat> described by Shanti Deva. Through the merits we've accumulated today, may all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, attain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. 
for as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. All right, thank you very much. And uh, please do not forget your homework. Again, to think about the reflection we did at the very beginning or the discussion we had on whether it's a football club, whether it's the table, whether it's a person, take some of those arguments, but also bring them together with what we learned towards, uh, well, more the latter part, the later part of today's class, how the three consequences arise from what you've learned, um, just to internalize it more. All right, great. And then have a compassionate and uh, wise week. And I'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Geshema. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dharma friends. <laughs> Hello, Kung Pen. Hi, Amy. <laughs> nice to see you. 